We're going to talk about how the treaty grew and uh, to the fact where Peter Sawchuk, you heard this morning, saying it's the most universal uh, arms control treaty now uh, in history. So that's a good sign. But a certain country here, namely Israel, is no, not, not yet a member, as you know, so we're going to discuss that. Uh, and then we're going to talk about implementation. There's a lot to actually nationally implement the treaty, and this sometimes can be a real burden on countries, particularly smaller countries, um, depending on what their legislative capability is and what their law enforcement capability is. And Yu Chalmers, who's just joined us, uh, will uh, talk about that. And then there's the demilitarization issue, and I'll talk about uh, the eight countries that have declared chemical weapons stockpiles uh, and how progress has gone. All of these could be, you know, full hour or two lectures or more, you know. So we'll try to we'll try to just hit the peaks of of these issues uh, and raise some questions and catalyze uh, discussion. Um, and I'll use the same type of system. We'll just stand your name tag on its, on its uh, side if you want to ask a question. Uh, I think as we go on, if there's any really technical question that's, you know, an acronym or something that's not, <clears throat> that's not understandable, just please, you know, speak up and ask. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jean Pascal. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you very much, and thank you to the conveners for uh, inviting me here uh, to this meeting. I'm already really enthusiastic about the way the discussions uh, this morning have uh, gone, and uh, it has been uh, very rich, and considering that uh, this is an audience wanting uh, information, I was uh, amazed by the things that I've been able uh, to learn, new dimensions and so on. In my presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, universality, but I'm going to talk about it in two dimensions. Uh, one dimension is, uh, you know, quantitatively, uh, that is, the number of states that join. But there is a, a second dimension to it, uh, which I call qualitative, and that dimension is more about how states go about implementing the treaty. It's no good just to have a treaty and many countries and then having most of the countries not implementing its uh, obligations uh, in their daily routines. And uh, from there, I'm uh, going to uh, present you with uh, two slides how actually civil society can contribute uh, to that uh, process of uh, implementing the treaty in two ways. One, uh, the normal, uh, say, uh, daily implementation in a variety of ways. The second one, if one is confronted with uh, allegations of use, and it's uh, a model more or less uh, based on, on Syria, but you never know which uh, the circumstances might be. So uh, in terms of uh, quantitative uh, universality, we've already heard the figures, 190 uh, states parties uh, thus far. Two more are on the verge of uh, becoming party to the convention. Uh, in terms of numbers, uh, the CWC today equals uh, the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. However, there's the big difference, and the big difference is, uh, of course, first, uh, the CWC is actually disarmament. It's about bringing one discrete category of weaponry to zero. Nobody can have any weapons who's party to the convention. And secondly, it's the verification of that commitment uh, to zero, which is undertaken by the international community. However, quite importantly, uh, in a division of labor. In other words, certain responsibilities are undertaken by the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons on behalf of the international community. But a very important part of the routine activities are actually the responsibility of individual states parties, and they have to uh, undertake these obligations inside their own uh, country. Now, coming uh, back to the quantitative uh, dimension, if I can have the first slide, uh, let me focus here on uh, the Middle East, the status of the prohibition of chemical and biological weapons in the Middle East. And uh, as you can see, uh, there are two states in the Middle East, in the right column, 
uh, not yet party to the convention, Egypt, which has neither signed nor ratified the convention, and Israel, which did sign it on the 13th of January, uh, 93. The BTWC, the Biological and Toxin uh, Weapons Convention, three states are uh, outside. This time, Egypt did sign uh, the convention, but Israel has not, and Syria is uh, the third state uh, that has uh, signed the convention, but it is not a party yet. But let us not forget that document from 1925, which is the Geneva Protocol, that essentially prohibits the use in armed conflict of chemical and uh, biological weapons. And here we see that, again, in the Middle East, two states have not signed it. However, this time we're talking about Oman and the United Arab Emirates. Now, why am I presenting you this table? That is, the situation as it is today, at least one international global agreement that deals with uh, chemical and biological weapons covers all the states in the Middle East. There may be gaps in terms of individual agreements, but somewhere even Egypt and Israel are committed not to use chemical biological weapons as a method of warfare because of the Geneva Protocol. So, in other words, uh, psychologically, the step to abandon a category of weapon in terms of development, production, and stockpiling, what we are talking about are two weapon categories that, in any case, the states cannot use in armed conflict. So, psychologically, the step to basically abandon all the preparations, if such activities actually take place, should not be uh, that big. Let me uh, give you another point of, of reference in terms of the importance of uh, the Chemical Weapons uh, Convention. And uh, Peter, this morning, already uh, made reference to the fact that there, are, there is trade in uh, a number of chemicals that have the potential of being applied for chemical weapon uh, purposes. Not necessarily the end product, but of course if we talk uh, about a chemical such as phosgene in World War I, that was the agent that killed most of the soldiers on the battlefields. Not mustard gas, but phosgene. And phosgene is so widespread produced in uh, large quantities. Chlorine is another one. However, what we saw in the Middle East, you, you will recall that in 91-92, the Arab League adopted a resolution that no member would sign up, ratify the Chemical Weapons Convention until Israel uh, becomes a party to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And actually what we've seen is a process over the years where more and more Arab League members joined the CWC. And if you plot that out on the map, the sequence of happening, you could actually see if you take the Arab Israeli cleavage in the Middle East as the geographical center of the whole thing, you could actually see that breaking uh, the Arab League uh, commitment, uh, so to speak, happened in the geographical periphery. So it was like uh, Morocco, um, Tunisia, Algeria on the western side, some of the Gulf monarchies on the eastern side. And the reason was actually rel uh, relatively easy to explain because their natural gas, their oil industries are all based on organic chemistry one way or another and they needed access to the technologies, uh, they needed access to certain chemicals uh, and so forth. And so the combination of on the one hand Article 6 of the convention that would progressively impose uh, export restrictions and by that I mean that the transfers of these types of technology would only be authorized among member states of the Organization for the Prohibition of uh, Chemical Weapons would kick in after a certain time. And secondly, Article 11, that promotes 
international cooperation for peaceful purposes in the field of uh, chemistry offered a number of benefits to actually improve um, the types of activities uh, they were doing. And so gradually what we saw was a movement from the peripheries, both in the west and the east, moving closer to the heartland of the Israeli-Arab uh, cleavage in the Middle East. So in the end, what we had was a situation of Syria, Egypt, and Israel being the sole uh, three holdout uh, countries. Jordan was a most interesting case. Um, if we go back to 97, Jordan was a country not possessing chemical weapons, but surrounded by at least two known possessors and with Israel a possibly suspected uh, possessor of chemical weapons. Uh, Jordan went to the OPCW, had discussions with the Director General uh, in those days, and the Director General made very explicit security guarantees to the Jordanian government under Article 10 of the Chemical Weapons Convention. And Article 10 deals with um, protection, the right to have protection against uh, chemical uh, weapons, and the right to have international assistance in the case of a threat with chemical weapons or actual use of chemical weapons against the country. And those guarantees extended by the DG very explicitly to Jordan were sufficient for that country to uh, sign up and uh, ratify the Chemical Weapons Convention. So the idea of international guarantees of protection uh, against uh, chemical weapons is also a powerful motivator for any country to, uh, to join uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention. If you're a party to it, of course, if anybody, be it a state or a terrorist entity, uh, a non-state actor, using chemical weapons against your population, you have the right to demand an investigation. Such an investigation would be an international recrimination of the violation of uh, a major international uh, norm, and it would rise above, let's say, the partisan politics of just one side in a conflict saying, you have used chemical weapons, and the other side saying no. There would be international confirmation, which is also quite important to uh, think of. So this is how, in the Middle East, you can actually plot on the map how a variety of provisions of the convention contributed to states becoming party to it, despite political opposition uh, for a variety of reasons which in and of themselves have nothing to do with the Chemical Weapons Convention per se. Let me come now to the qualitative universality. Uh, I have briefly mentioned already that division of labor, international community versus national state party. What we have uh, under the CWC is the absolute obligation to implement the convention. And implement, uh, it means putting all types of legislation uh, in place, I mean, if only to allow the international inspectors onto the territory to uh, go into factories and military installations that are of uh, relevance uh, and so forth. However, there is also the dimension that whatever is prohibited to a state party should also be prohibited to individuals. So to the nationals of the state party, whether they operate on the territory of that state, or if the nationals undertake activities that are prohibited outside the country. That's the extraterritoriality uh, principle. And you must adopt that. My country, Belgium, for example, had to introduce the concept of extraterritoriality into its legal system as a consequence of the Chemical Weapons Convention. We, we didn't know that uh, principle uh, before. But essentially what you have is nobody, whether it's a foreign actor or uh, a legal uh, actor uh, such as a company, working on your territory can undertake anything that violates uh, the treaty. So nationals and foreigners on your territory. At the same time, your own nationals, whether inside the country or outside the country, cannot undertake anything that would violate the treaty, which is a very important element, in particular because this is the way 
The CWC today can tackle the problem of terrorism and criminals that might resort to chemical uh, agents. As Peter has already explained this morning, you know, Um Shin Rikyo happened like two years uh, before entry into force of the convention, but the whole treaty had been negotiated. It was a totally new issue uh, that uh, came up in, in those days. So qualitative uh, implementation is extremely important uh, aspect of the security regime that uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention is. Another dimension is, of course, uh, you know, the inspections, uh, a variety of, of things uh, to organize. I mean, if you have to oblige your companies inside your country to report because your own national authority, it's a body you have to set up within the government as a kind of a focal point for the OPCW to interact and other countries, other states parties to interact uh, with each other. They must be able, they must have the authority to collect all the information to then submit to the OPC. That's a totally different dimension, but I want to uh, emphasize here uh, the security dimension that is tackling terrorism and crime with toxic uh, substances. Bear in mind that the CWC applies to all toxic substances. It does not use a criterion such as lethality or uh, non-lethal uh, and so on. So even if you have a situation of an individual using, say, ricin in a type of assassination plot, that would be covered by the Chemical Weapons uh, Convention. Probably there are other laws or, I inside your country to deal with murder uh, and uh, poisoning and so on. But it would be one case where even in the context of a political conflict, you can actually apply uh, the Chemical Weapons uh, Convention. Now, um, having given this uh, brief uh, outlook, what can uh, civil society, what kind of role can civil society Next one, please, uh, play in this. Well, what I've uh, done here is basically try to uh, sketch out a, a situation. The, the nice round circle uh, to the left is the core of the treaty with the variety of activities, obligations that states parties need to, be, uh, need to undertake. And of course, part of those obligations are international, the other ones are specifically done by a state party. But outside the treaty, there are a variety of other activities state parties can undertake. Let's say, if you think of the CWC as a security regime, you would probably have enough with doing the first circle. If you want to have uh, the CWC as a cooperative regime where you want to build confidence in whatever you're doing, where you want to provide context so that other people, other countries can understand that whatever you're doing is perfectly legitimate, you can enhance transparency through a variety of other uh, activities. They're not really obligatory under the treaty, but there are ways uh, for you uh, to go about it. And then the third circle is what uh, civil society can do. And as you can see from the various brown arrows, there are a variety of uh, things you can do. Civil society, they could monitor open source uh, literature, which is also something states uh, can do. Uh, open source literature to check, are the declarations of my country uh, correct? You can participate, assess uh, investigations of alleged use of toxic chemicals. I'm going to come back uh, to that. But very importantly is uh, the role of civil society in maintaining the norm. That is, to undertake activities uh, to see that the full integrity of the treaty and the norm it represents against the use of toxicants in violence, armed conflict, and so on, are uh, maintained. And this is something where civil society would interact with the state party itself, its own uh, government, rather than with the international organization. Um, this is, uh, these are very important elements. Uh, 
completeness of declarations, if, if you really get uh, into that, it's really understanding what the treaty is about. And it's not just that uh, perhaps you should be extremely suspicious what this or that factory or research laboratory might be doing, but it is particularly uh, an activity to understand, for example, how science and technology evolve because of those developments, how they might pose a challenge to the treaty, and then to come up with a number of solutions, a number of uh, proposals on how the country might adopt, for example, its legislation uh, to cover those new types of developments. And many toxic chemicals are being uh, researched, are being uh, produced for perfectly uh, legitimate commercial reasons. However, they can also easily become available for uh, hostile purposes. The mere fact, and tomorrow on uh, terrorism I'm going to get a bit deeper in that, but the, the mere fact that, for example, a criminal or terrorist entity might get hold of commercial stocks, you know, a depot where a company keeps uh, some of uh, the substances, might get hold of it and then one way or another release it. That's a question of chemical security. It's also interesting to point out these types of uh, issues that might uh, pop up. Then for the final slide, here is a, a different way how uh, civil society might get uh, involved. And this is in a war armed conflict uh, situation where basically civil society can be divided in two major uh, components. Uh, those are the people actually living, trying to survive in the war zone and starting to report on a number of uh, incidents. And they will contact uh, the press uh, most likely. Uh, they will uh, contact uh, international organizations to publicize the whole thing. The second group of civil society are then uh, what I would call the expert and activist communities in other countries than the country at war or countries uh, at war. And then they bring to bear their expertise in terms of critically analyzing whatever is coming out in terms of allegations um, from uh, the war zone. So that can lead to informing governments, international uh, governments to start acting, international organizations such as the one uh, for the prohibition of uh, chemical weapons or UN bodies can then be mobilized and uh, go over to action. Now, this may seem a bit abstract uh, to you as uh, Israelis, yet I personally can uh, already see an where are the microphones here? Hidden microphones, none? <laughs> no, but uh, one element, uh, for example, uh, where civil society could actually already uh, undertake uh, concrete uh, action is in the various manifestations. There is, uh, let's say, quite liberal use of right control agents here in Israel for a variety of uh, activities. You know, if you already start simply documenting those incidents, uh, that you start uh, building up uh, certain types of uh, statistics on the circumstances under which uh, they were used, uh, number of casualties, uh, you know, duration, <coughs> uh, and so forth, and you start reporting on that, that would already be a great help. Why do, do I say that? Well, one, right to control agents such as tear gas are prohibited as a means of warfare uh, under the CWC. However, they are authorized for law enforcement and domestic right control. But as we are dealing with uh, a number of uh, conflicts between ethnic uh, communities, uh, as we are dealing with uh, counter-terrorism, counter-insurgency operations, the, the borderlines of law enforcement become very fluid and they move slightly into areas that might be called armed conflict. Uh, take, for example, uh, the Moscow Theater in 2002, where hostages were taken uh, at a, a chemical incapacitant carfentanil. Now, carfentanil is a commercial sedative, but it's used to subdue elephants and rhinos and uh, hippos, uh, that type of animals. You apply it to humans, 
And in addition, people are subdued, but then you kill them with conventional weapons. And this is increasingly controversial in the context of the Chemical Weapons Convention. But f for, for you, it might already be interesting in terms of an exercise to uh, start documenting uh, that because I can't put my finger on it, but somehow I wonder whether uh, the way right control agents are used by the Israeli military security uh, forces, if that is not an obstacle to the ratification of the convention. I don't know. I put it up as a question to the Israeli friends here, and it's up to them to investigate and perhaps uh, push the issue if it's relevant. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Jean-Pascal. Now we'll, I think we'll all talk one after the other, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion, if that's okay with you all. Um, I'll pass the mic to you, Chalmers. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, before I start, I just want to check if I can get my slides loaded up. Um, unlike Jean-Pascal, I've gone for somewhat more slides, so I'm going to be keeping that guy over there kind of busy while we do this. But um, anyway, it's great to be here. I want to thank everybody, the Chemical Weapons Convention Coalition, uh, Israel Disarmament Movement, and uh, of course Green Cross for having me here. Um, I'm going to kind of take on some of the national implementation issues that Jean-Pascal raised with his presentation by giving a general overview about how a state becomes um, a party to the Chemical Weapons Convention, what that really involves on a national level, um, and what's involved in essentially remaining a state party and working with the OPCW um, in the future. If I can get the next slide, um, I'll give you just a quick overview of Vertic and what we do. We're um, an independent, not-for-profit organization in London. Um, we spend nearly all of our time promoting the effective verification and implementation of international agreements. We do this in two ways. We have um, a, a big um, group of people that work primarily on research, so new verification techniques for, for various things, chemical weapons convention, nuclear weapons, radiological weapons, things like that. And um, a group of people that work on national implementation assistance. Um, they fly around the world at the request of um, countries to help draft legislation, essentially. Um, and this team have worked on um, helping states implement the Chemical Weapons Convention, the Biological Weapons Convention, um, Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material, and th the list goes on and on and on. Um, but with that being said, I'll move on to my, my next slide. Um, just to give you, I'm sure you have heard this all before, um, a quick introduction to the Chemical Weapons Convention and what it really does. As you said, 190 state parties, two signatories, um, including Israel, and four non-signatories. Um, I thought I'd throw in some some nice little factoids towards the end about how much um, work the OPCW has done to date. Um, 54,617 metric tons of the most sensitive chemical weapons destroyed by 2013. And out of the 96 weapon production facilities that have been declared to the OPCW, 65 of those have been destroyed or converted. So uh, they've done quite a lot of good work so far. Moving on to the next slide. I thought I would introduce you guys to the convention itself. I actually brought along a copy of the text. Um, it's a fairly weighty tome. Um, I'm not going to go into every single page of it. You'll be glad to know. Um, but I'll give you um, a quick overview of some of the most important articles of it. Uh, Article 1, as you might imagine, gives a view of the general obligations to the treaty, um, such as prohibiting the development, stockpiling, use, transfer, export, import of chemical weapons. Um, the obligation to, of course, um, get rid of any facilities that you may have when you sign the convention, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the third article um, lists a bunch of declarations that a state has to make when it joins the Chemical Weapons Convention, and this includes um, declaring any existing chemical stockpiles, any old chemical stockpiles, um, any existing and old facilities, and a plan to get rid of those um, at some point in the future. The exact way a state is meant to do that is uh, listed in Articles 4 and 5. Um, but then Article 6 goes on to what Jean-Pascal was talking about in terms of the activities that are not prohibited. You can quite happily use a whole range of chemicals for purely peaceful purposes, such as, as, as research, um, the development of uh, protection measures for industry and things like that, as long as they're properly declared and they're properly verified. 
Um, Article 7, which is the one I'm going to focus the most on, is um, essentially the requirements for national implementation, the laws that a country has to put in place, um, how these laws affect its relationship with the OPCW and what that really means in, in practical terms. Um, the annex, um, which is somewhere in the middle of here, has uh, the list of chemicals essentially of concern. Um, there's, there's three of them. I'm not sure if you've heard this all before, but I'll give you a quick overview. The first list, Schedule 1, is of the most sensitive um, chemicals. These are essentially chemical weapons um, on Schedule 1. They include nerve agents, mustard gases, things like that. Um, the second list um, is slightly less sensitive. There's still a whole bunch of very toxic chemicals on there, but um, the majority of the list is uh, ingredients, the main key ingredients for the Schedule 1 chemical weapons. And the third one, um, while it does actually contain phosgene, which uh, Jean-Pascal mentioned earlier, primarily basic ingredients for chemical weapons. Um, and finally, the, the vast majority of the text, actually, I'd say about a third of it, is dedicated to the implementation verification of the declarations and the obligations in the treaty. So moving on to the next slide, in a little bit more detail, the national implementation measures in Article 7 um, require a state to outlaw any activity prohibited by the CWC. I think we've gone over those a few times already. Um, and as Jean-Pascal said, we have to designate uh, or establish a national authority to serve as, a, as essentially a focal point or um, a liaison to the OPCW. In the UK, this is the Department of Energy and Climate Change. In the US, it's the State Department. Um, Article 6, um, activities not prohibited. Um, it's required that states will adopt measures to control the peaceful use of listed chemicals. Um, and it also needs to uh, allow the OPCW to come in and verify that these chemicals are being used peacefully. So, on to national implementation measures themselves. The next slide. We break them down to seven broad categories just to make it kind of easier to comprehend. I'm going to go through each of these ones in turn. Um, just so you have an idea about what practical steps have to be taken to implement CWC. So, moving on to the next slide. You'd naturally start with definitions. Um, to control chemical weapons, toxic chemicals, you have to understand what that really means. Um, there shouldn't be that much leeway for people to claim ambiguity in terms of uh, the terms. Uh, thankfully, the convention itself gives you a whole bunch of definitions that can be easily translated into a national law. I think toxic chemical is defined along the lines of um, any chemical that by its chemical action can cause serious harm or death, no matter how it's um, produced. Once you have those definitions in place, then you can move on to prohibiting um, certain activities. So for the actual for chemical weapons themselves, you need to have a law that prohibits the development, production, acquisition, as we said, of chemical weapons. You need to have um, a similar provision in that law that prohibits uh, engaging in military preparations to use chemical weapons, assisting, encouraging other people to um, undertake prohibited activities. And you also need a law that states that you will not use riot control agents as a method of warfare. Moving on to the next slide. In terms of um, the activities that you are allowed to undertake, peaceful uses, you still aren't allowed to transfer uh, Schedule 1 and 2 chemicals to people outside the convention. As uh, Jean-Pascal said, uh, people in North Africa and in the Gulf were particularly sensitive to this. They didn't have access to, uh, to chemicals that they needed for their oil programs. You're also not allowed to produce, acquire, retain, or use, um, or transfer Schedule 1 chemicals without having a license from the state. So the state can give you a license to use these things, but it has to be very, very, very well controlled. Um, and of course, uh, Schedule 3, even the least sensitive of the list of chemicals, um, can't really be uh, transferred to other parties without some form of certification that has to be gained through a national program of some sort. Um, and again, as John Pascal said, you need to make sure that these laws apply to all relevant parties. So not only those within the state, but nationals that are outside of your state. So you have to have this extraterritoriality um, rule in your national legislation so you can prosecute anybody that goes against the convention, even if they're not necessarily in your state at the time when they did it. Um, if possible, it's also best to see if you can extend um, the criminal legislation, not just to, to so-called natural persons, individuals such as you or I, but to um, legal persons, which is essentially a, a very fancy way of saying organizations, corporations, large bodies that have um, some type of legal personality in the state. Moving on. 
you then have to make sure that you have some form of kind of licensing body and mechanism in place within your national legislation. Um, as I said earlier, for Schedule 1, you have to make sure you're licensing the production, acquisition, everything about them has to be very, very carefully licensed. No transfers to people outside of state parties um, and no retransfers, so no sending it to someone who might send it on to somebody else. Um, similar for se Schedule 2 chemicals, I'll move on quickly just so I don't... Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, and Schedule 3 chemicals, again, another form of licensing or declaration. There has to be some way that the state knows what's going on, what's being produced, where and how. Um, you need to have some form of licensing to permit the transfer of these chemicals. And again, no transfers to people outside the convention without some form of permit from the state. And of course, all of these control mechanisms come together with a very detailed form of record keeping. This is uh, the primary mechanism with which a state can communicate with the OPCW. It has to know which chemicals are being produced where, how much. Um, and that's really, really important. I'll get to that in a minute. If I move on to the next slide. You might also want to um, develop national legislation uh, for chemical safety and security. Now, this isn't strictly required by the Chemical Weapons Convention. You have to bear in mind uh, the safety of people and the environment, but you're not required to um, necessarily implement all of these laws. But um, UN Security Council Resolution 1540, which all states, all states are meant to abide by, requires people to put in place effective um, security um, legislation for chemicals. Um, such mechanisms could involve establishing a system of notification for accidents, loss or theft, so you know what's gone wrong where and when. Um, some mechanism with which to train personnel at the facilities, you can have personnel background checks, physical protection within and outside facilities, etc, etc. So this is um, an important addition to any chemical weapons legislation. If we can move on. And then finally, you need to be able to enforce uh, this legislation. The main conduit, as you said, between the state and the OPCW has to be the establishment of a national authority. Um, that national authority sometimes serves to coordinate international legal cooperation and assistance um, for states that are trying to sign up but don't necessarily have the capacity to do so. Um, you also need to make sure that you've worked into your legislation permission for OPCW inspectors to come and check all of your declarations. Um, and a final kind of addition to this enforcement is actually developing your own domestic capability to go around and investigate um, potential misuses of chemicals. So if I can move on. That's essentially all of the laws, well, a, a, an ideal law would have all of those bases covered, um, and that would um, be the primary mechanism by which a state can become a party to uh, the CWC. But um, once it has all that in place, it also has to give a very clear picture to the OPCW of what chemicals it has in its, uh, in its, within its boundaries, what activities it has. So it has to give a very large um, initial declaration um, of chemicals and activities to the OPCW. Now, the amount that you have to declare and the details of these declarations depends upon the sensitivity of the activities. So if these activities involve Schedule 1 chemicals, then naturally you have to go into quite a lot of detail about where, it is, where it's happening and how it's happening. But for Schedule 3 chemicals, you only have to start declaring this stuff on a regular basis if you have facilities that are producing, say, more than 30 metric tons of this stuff a year. So the requirements um, change depending on, on what's going on. Um, these are obviously sent to the OPCW, who then organize on-site inspections, so inspections actually at the facilities to verify these declarations. And as above, the frequency and intensity of these inspections depends upon the sensitivity of uh, the chemicals at hand. Um, for facilities that deal with Schedule 1 chemicals, they will always be inspected pretty much once a year, or I think they should be. Jean-Pascal might um, correct me if I'm wrong on this one. Um, but for Schedule 3 facilities um, that are producing, you know, above 30 metric tons a year, essentially the facilities that will be investigated are picked at random and no facility will be inspected more than twice a year. So that it's trying to strike a balance between being effective but also not necessarily being too intrusive um, and disrupting the activities uh, going on there. Now, if any problems arise from uh, these inspections, let's say they find that there's far fewer chemical precursors than the declaration of state or that there's some undeclared activity, 
then the first port of call is always for the OPCW to work with the state in question to try and resolve um, these ambiguities. But if that doesn't necessarily happen, if the state can't explain it properly or it seems like there might be suggestions of non-compliance, then these questions can escalate from the technical secretariat, the OPCW, to the executive council, all the way up to the general conference of all the state parties there. So that's how questions kind of rise up through the inspection mechanism. Um, states themselves can raise a question with the OPCW. If one state feels that the, another state may be non-complying, then they can ask the OPCW to investigate. And again, the whole process starts if if these things aren't resolved properly, then it escalates up towards um, other levels to try and address it. And in the most extreme situations, and I have to emphasize this has never actually happened yet, a state can request a challenge inspection um, at any, any facility within um, a, a suspected state. Um, if the OPCW agrees, I think it has to, if there's a vote and 75% of them disagree, then it doesn't go ahead. But if, if the OPCW agrees, um, then the state party has to open its doors to the inspectors uh, to come in and um, check for any signs of non-compliance. And I, I have to emphasize again, it's, it's an extremely um, drastic move to take. Um, no one's tried yet, because I think the shame and the cost involved of carrying out one of these when you're wrong is quite high. Um, so quickly moving on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so it, I've given an outline of the type of legislation provisions that have to be included. How might a state go about it? There are three different ways. You can have kind of a comprehensive chemical weapons law that, that covers all of the provisions that, that I've outlined and, and maybe others that stands alone as a chemical weapons law. You can wrap all of these various different sensitive materials together into a weapons of mass destruction law. Um, one that covers the control of biological weapons, controls chemical weapons, controls radiological material. It will separate these things out into different chapters because reporting requirements may be different, but you can wrap them all up in a weapons of mass destruction law. And I think India, South Africa, some other states have taken this path. But if you have a, a large number of um, laws and regulations in place that essentially cover things like um, export control and licensing, then you can take advantage of the laws that are already there. Um, for instance, I think Israel has, um, has a law on licensing the export of sensitive um, goods, including chemicals. So they already have that base covered. Um, I'm fairly sure there'll be some type of um, safety and licensing laws for chemical activities. Um, so you can stitch together existing legislation, um, maybe patching it with some, some additions here, some additions there, to make sure that you've covered all the bases. So there are three main ways of doing this. And now, to, to finish, if I can have the, like, the last slide, please. Jean Pascal's gone over a number of the, the benefits of, of these measures um, before, but I think it's good to emphasize them here, particularly um, the kind of the development of national capacity that you get from implementing the Chemical Weapons Convention by having laws in place to outlaw the production and use of chemical weapons, then it's much easier to investigate, prosecute, and punish um, offences that may be committed on your soil. Um, from an industrial perspective, as we said, there's a whole bunch of chemicals that a state cannot get access to from other state parties unless it's part of the convention. So if you join the convention, then you have much better access to uh, certain chemicals. Um, you can also essentially prove to potential investors that you know you have an effective legislation in place, you have effective monitoring, effective regulations. It becomes a lot more attractive to, to people from the outside. And finally, um, access to assistance and protection against the use of CW. Um, I think the Jordan case that Jean Pascal highlighted is particularly interesting um, because that is quite a powerful incentive, I would say. And essentially on that... Um, happy note on that kind of optimistic note um, if I have the final slide just to give some contact details for, for myself and for Vertic if uh, any of you have any questions about either the CWC or the work that we do I look forward to some questions thanks so you, you're in London is it yep okay because you know Scott Spencer has a different area code so a country code so he's he's Switzerland he's yeah, right but London is really the main office, yeah. right? Okay, great. Okay, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. We can put on the, uh, whatever it's called, the Tel Aviv uh, 
I think it's basically Tel Aviv is the title of the uh, PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to switch gears and talk about nuts and bolts a little bit, uh, destruction of chemical weapons. Um, this could be a very long and, and complicated <clears throat> presentation, so I'm going to try to go through it fairly quickly. Um, but I'll show a lot of pictures, too, uh, to give you a sense of the, of the complications and the difficulty in, in, in moving towards eliminating you know, well over, well over 72,000 metric tons of, of uh, chemical weapons in eight, eight declared possessor states today. So you, you can go on to the next slide. The first um, thing I really want to say and emphasize is that I mentioned uh, kicking off this morning, we're in a very interesting period of time where we've, we've made it one century you know, before the major use of, from the major, first major use of chemical warfare, chemical weapons in warfare. And that was by the Germans uh, in the trench warfare of the Belgium, Belgium and Ypres, Belgium, uh, on April 22nd, uh, 1915, when the Germans, uh, the Germans brought in 5,700 canisters of chlorine. They weren't weapons; it was just compressed gas. And uh, when the wind started to blow the right way, they released, they opened the the canisters and let the chlorine float you know, towards the, the Belgians and, and all the other Allied forces there. And, uh, and this is a famous picture, actually, that's taken from World War I. Uh, next slide. You can see the, uh, all of the soldiers there partially blinded, not by chlorine, but really by mustard and other gases that we use later on. But overall, in World War I, 90,000 were killed. It's estimated a million injured by chemical weapons, 190,000 tons of agents produced by Germany, France, Britain, the United States, may have been others too. And, uh, and uh, April 22nd, that should say 1915, not 2015. Uh, 5,700 canisters of chlorine used by Germany. And the, the picture there is actually uh, uh, Menin Gate in Ypres, uh, Ypres, Belgium, in which there's a ceremony recognizing all this um, every, every evening, I think. Uh, and that's a picture I took uh, a couple of years ago when I was there. So next slide. The convention, I think you has talked about this and, and Jean Pascal to some extent. 12 year, long time, was really over 12 years, depends on when you start counting. Um, ended in a force 1997, U.S. and Russia both ratified in 97. The U.S. Ra ratified, you know, just briefly before, a few days before the, uh, it ended in a force. Russia came thereafter, so Russia was not one of the original uh, member states. 190 states parties today, six countries we've talked about, and eight countries have declared stockpiles. So let me uh, go on to the next slide. These are the eight countries. Russia, 40,000 metric tons. The United States, 28,600 metric tons. We always talk about it as U.S. tons. In U.S. tons, it's 31,500. Uh, India, about 1,000 tons, plus or minus. South Korea, about 1,000 tons, plus or minus. Those, those that tonnage is still uh, classified. You can't, really can't find the exact tonnage in the public literature. Uh, Libya, 26, a little bit slightly over 26 metric tons. Albania, 16. Iraq, we talked about earlier. We don't know what Iraq really has. It's all detritus or debris, uh, former weapons, old weapons that are in these two bunkers that have come under the control of, uh, reportedly, of ISIS now uh, outside of Fallujah. And then Syria, about 1,300, slightly more than 1,308, I think, is the latest number. Uh, but in total, this, these numbers don't add to the total here, but it's more or less, it's 72,500 <coughs> metric tons. It's a lot. And of course, there were hundreds of thousands of metric tons more than this before the treaty came into force long ago that many other countries produced and, and have since, prior to the treaty, gotten rid of. Uh, next slide. So let me, I just want to give you a sense of both the big two uh, stockpiles in the U.S. and Russia. In the United States, there are nine stockpiles that were declared. Uh, this was all pretty public information uh, prior to 1990. Uh, the United States and the Russians and the Soviets, actually back then, talked uh, bilaterally about uh, destroying their stockpiles while the treaty was being negotiated. And uh, the United States actually began destroying its stockpile in 1990, unilaterally, uh, long seven years before the treaty came into force. Uh, so the U.S., uh, even though the United States always have, hates to talk about unilateral disarmament, it in fact engaged in unilateral disarmament. Uh, it built the first uh, incinerator on Johnson Atoll in the late 1980s, 
and the Johnson Atoll incinerator actually began operating in, in 1990. Uh, there were percentages there, I don't know if you can read them from where you are, but the percentages you notice in the United States of the size of the stockpiles are quite different. So you have the smallest, the very smallest stockpile on the right hand side called bluegrass. Uh, that's 2%, it's about, it's about uh, what would that be, a couple thousand tons. No, no, it's less than that. It's it's five hundred. No, it's five hundred and twenty-five U.S. tons. Yeah, it's four hundred and seventy-eight metric tons, something like that. And then you have in the middle there, the uh, or towards the upper left, Tuella Chemical Agent Disposal Facility, forty-four percent of the U.S. stockpile, and that's something in the range of fourteen thousand metric tons. So enormous. All of those are gone now, except for Bluegrass, Kentucky, on the right and Pueblo, Colorado in the middle. And those are the two stockpiles remaining uh, that will be destroyed over the next uh, seven or eight, maybe as long as nine years. Uh, next. Russian. <clears throat> uh, this is a small map, so you can't see it too well, but the, uh, the Russian stockpiles are, are seven. They're all very similar in size. They're all around five to 7,000 tons, a uh, total of 40,000 metric tons. Uh, the one in the far right, you see, is a place called Shucha in the uh, Kurgan Oblast, which is just north of uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, beneath that red line, you see that the red border is Kazakhstan. And that's actually what got me first engaged myself in chemical weapons destruction back in 1994, when uh, I was part of the first uh, U.S. government on-site inspection of a Russian stockpile. And we went into this you know, unknown place out in the Siberian steppes east of the Ural, it's the only one east of the Ural mountain range. Um, and we saw, you know, two million nerve agent artillery shells in about 80 warehouses in the middle of a remote forested area surrounded by 14 villages, total of 40,000 Russians, Russian peasants, really in Siberian agricultural workers. Um, very little security on the site. Uh, as I say, there were two million artillery shells ready for the battlefield on this site, and there were a thousand missile warheads filled with uh, nerve agent mini bombs in the nose. Most of those are still there. Actually, a good number of them are still there, still being destroyed now. But that really got us all uh, very revved up over the importance of uh, preventing the proliferation of, of these weapons. I mean, remember, this is 1994. This was prior to the Aum Shinrikyo terrorist attack in the subways of Tokyo, and, and really prior to Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden and, and all the other terrorist activities over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, but we really had the impression that these things could disappear overnight if we weren't careful. And we didn't want any of them to you know, wind up in downtown Tel Aviv or Washington, D.C. or London or Paris or Berlin or anywhere else. So. Um, the United States and the Russians at that point, you know, really started to move forward very quickly. Uh, Russia didn't begin to destroy its stockpile until 2002. So the United States actually began 12 years ahead of the Russians in destroying its stockpile, even though they had both agreed in the 80s to sort of move forward together. Um, the Russians were way behind, but they've since caught up, actually, and, and really surpassed, in some ways, the United States. So next, next slide. That's what the stockpile at Shuchi uh, looked like. Those are pictures I took in 1994. It'll give you a sense of the, you know, you walked into these giant warehouses that look like uh, wine racks filled with wine bottles, only these things, you know, held, you know, a few, a few kilograms of, uh, of um, you know, nerve agent in each one of these shells ready for the battlefield. Uh, next slide. And this was actually a uh, public hearing uh, and a groundbreaking ceremony that we organized at Shuchi uh, at the site of the destruction facility, not the stockpile, but the destruction facility, which began construction in 2002. And this was a uh, more or less a groundbreaking ceremony in which the United States and the Russians organized this for, we had 250 press from all over the world there. And this is a very remote area. You know, to fly three hours east of Moscow and then you had to drive for two hours from the nearest airport uh, in the uh, in the town of Chelyabinsk, the neighboring uh, the neighboring uh, uh, oblast, and the funny story here 
<clears throat> I've told once in a while, on the right-hand side, you'll see uh, five different calibers of, of nerve agent artillery shells. And uh, Jill Doherty, the well-known CNN reporter who was stationed in Moscow at the time, came and held up one of these, picked up one of these shells and spoke into the camera uh, to do a CNN report. And she said, uh, these are all, uh, you know, a few of the uh, two million nerve agent artillery shells the Russians have. And of course, these are training weapons here at the groundbreaking ceremony. And the, and the uh, commander tapped her on the shoulder and, and, and he said, uh, Miss Doherty, uh, these aren't training shells. And <clears throat> she said, what do you mean? He said, these are all live agent shells. You know, I, we brought up this morning from the uh, stockpile to show everybody. And so the Russians actually transported these in the back of a pickup truck uh, 20, 20 kilometers over Siberian roads. You know, two giant missile warheads filled with, I don't know how many kilo, you know, kilograms of, uh, of uh, nerve agent mini bombs, and then, the, and then the five artillery shells. It's what? <laughs> no, no, yeah, right, right, right. That's a detonator, right? No. So, so this is, remember, this is after we expressed all our concern about the, you know, the danger and the proliferation nature and the risks of diversion and theft and, and loss and all the rest in 1994. This is eight years later, and they're driving these th things around the roads, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in the Kogan Oblast of Siberia. So this is what has all prompted us to move forward as quickly as we could to get rid of these things. Uh, next, next slide. So uh, very quickly in the United States, Destruction began in 1990. Um, they began on Johnson Atoll in the Pacific Ocean, and that was a, that's an island uh, in the middle of the Pacific, 750 miles, about a, th a little over 1,000 kilometers west of Hawaii. Um, a big stockpile there, uh, probably 2,000 tons, I think, or more, that had been uh, brought secretly uh, from Okinawa, where they had been forward deployed in Germany. Uh, and they were for a long time sitting in the middle of Germany in NATO for NATO forces. Um, that's a picture actually of Umatilla, Oregon, and it gives you a size, that's taken about a mile away, but it gives you a sense of the size of these facilities. These are enormous facilities, each, each costing, uh, you know, four to five billion dollars um, to construct and operate and then dismantle. They're all ripped to the ground uh, after the program is finished. $30 billion to date spent, uh, as Lenny, I think, talked about earlier. It'll probably surpass $40 billion, billion by the time we're finished. It's one of the biggest non-weapons programs, you know, in the history of the world, I think. Um, seven to nine more years to go. Uh, two, fil two facilities, Bluegrass and Pueblo, still under construction. It's been a long, it's been 24 years since we've been destroying chemical weapons, and we still have another almost, almost a decade to go to finish the process. Uh, next, uh, in Russia, this is a picture from um, one of the nerve agent sites, I think it's um, Meritkovsky in Russia, and it shows you the big aerial bombs they have. What the, what the workers are doing there is they're opening the aerial bombs, which are filled with nerve agent, and they're measuring to see how much airspace is in the bomb. Then they're introducing a neutralant, basically hot water and um, sodium hydroxide then plugging the bomb up again and letting it, rolling it back into the uh, warehouse to cook. It's a sort of exothermic, exothermic chemical operation. And after two or three months, they go back in and measure again to see if it's been 99.9% .9 at least destroyed. Uh, and if so, they drain it <coughs> and, then, and then either uh, burn the, the, liquid, uh, the liquid or treat, treat the liquid or solidify it in some fashion for, for you know, permanent final second stage solution. They've destroyed two stockpiles, uh, both Lewisite stockpiles. Facilities there at a place called Gorny and the other one at um, Kambaka were built by the Germans <coughs> uh, and a German company called Eisenmann. Uh, and they've spent around eight billion dollars to date. Three of that billion was spent by the West, primarily the United States and Germany. Uh, but the, the British, the Australians, uh, the Canadians, uh, all the Scandinavians, uh, the Dutch, um, many others are actually very much involved too, but the kind of the big three were, the main one was really the United States. Germany, 50% of that, and then uh, Britain, probably another, another quarter of that. 
And they uh, originally said, along with the Americans, that they would finish in 2007. Because we haven't done that. Then they said they'd finish in 2012. And we haven't done that, obviously. Uh, the Russians then said they would finish in 2015, next year. And next month in uh, the OPSW, when we're all there for the uh, Conference of States parties, they will announce that they're now projecting 2020. So all of this has sort of slipped and slipped and slipped, partly due to the complexity and the costs and the politics involved and all. Uh, next. So, uh, I think 2020 is pretty likely, yeah. And the United States has said for its own program, 2023. Uh, I, I think we all have joked over the last five or six years that the Russian and American programs will converge over time. And because uh, nobody wants to get too far ahead of the other one, ironically. Um, and so I think, you know, the United States is probably likely to finish if, if construction and, and systemization continues to go very well, which it is. Uh, maybe 2021, 22, and Russia could be, it could be 2021. So it's they're gonna be very close, I think. And just quickly, Albania destroyed its stockpile in 2007. Um, you know, Albania, Albania ironically joined the convention, declaring itself a non-possessor state. And then about six years later, in 2003, I think it was, I think it was 2003, they said kind of, oops, we think we have a stockpile. And, <laughs> And they invited the Americans and the Germans and the Swiss, I think the Greeks also went, uh, to check out this stockpile you see on the right. And th there were these mysterious looking canisters with Chinese markings on the outside uh, out up in the mountains in this little garage with absolutely no security on it outside of Tirana. And so we're, we're actually very fortunate that we found this little garage uh, that had 16 metric tons of mustard agent. Um, and the other, the other big challenge, uh, not to go on at length about this though, but Eisenmann fortunately agreed uh, from Germany to go in and build a kind of mini incinerator to burn this stuff right on site because nobody wants to move this stuff if you can help it. And that's where the Syrian operation is interesting because the Syrian stuff moved all over, you know, the whole uh, European continent um, and the Mediterranean. Um, so they moved in a small incinerator. The Americans paid for it all. And... Uh, and they started up, they put one of these containers in at a time, and unfortunately, Eisenmann uh, miscalculated about the heat and the speed of burning these containers. And they estimated the first container would take 19 minutes to burn in the incinerator. It took 19 seconds to burn. It basically exploded in the incinerator and, and uh, worked up such a fire, you know, a furnace fire, that it burned a hole right through the bottom of the incinerator. Almost killed the workers in the in the thing. So they shut it down immediately, burned out the afterburner, and Albania was right up against this legal deadline under the Chemical Weapons Convention. And they couldn't find a furnace qualified welder to come in and fix the, fix the incinerator for over six weeks. So in the meantime, Albania was the first country to violate, technically violate its treaty deadlines under the Chemical Weapons Convention. And everyone, you know, understood it was a technical problem and nobody's fault and everyone blessed Albania and said it's just glad we're just glad to get rid of it uh, but hurry up and get the job done so um, Albania went forward with the Germans and um, finished another two months later so it was it worked out fine but the interesting other little bit of story news here is Albania was the country that the United States and the OPSW went to to ask if they could handle the destruction of the Syrian stockpile because they're very close, they're very close to the Middle East here, and <clears throat> wouldn't be far to carry it. And they've all already got this experience behind them. And Albania immediately uh, rejected that process. But one of the reasons they told me they rejected it is because the Germans and the Americans and the OPSW, uh, in verifying it, never cleaned up the secondary waste from the incineration program. So the site in Albania still has the secondary waste the toxic waste from the uh, Albanian destruction program in 2006 and 2007. Uh, it can't be used for anything, no. And really has to be under, I believe under the Chemical Weapons Convention destroyed. Uh, but it's still sitting there in, in you know, toxic waste barrels. And the Albanians are waiting for someone miraculously to come in, I guess, other than themselves and clean it up. So anyway, South Korea, 2008, uh, we don't know the size of that stockpile. Very secret program. 
the, so the South Koreans, as some of you know, Jean Pascal knows this, refuse to allow their name to be used at the OPCW. Uh, so they get infuriated when someone shows a slide like this that puts them in the list. Because at the OPCW officially, as Peter knows well, you talk about Albania, India, Libya, Iraq, Syria, the United States, Russia, and another state party. And everyone kind of, is it? Yeah, if Peter was doing this, it'd say another state party or a state party. Um, and everyone around, you know, the, in the general meeting room, you know, smiles and says, oh, South Korea, okay, all right. Um, but they're still highly sensitive about this and there's no information on their program. Um, there's a lot of speculation why, but I'm, we can talk about that later if you want. India, also a highly secret program, but the Indians themselves allow their name to be used as a possessor state, have talked about it publicly a bit. Um, but there's no information publicly as to where the stockpile was, how it was destroyed, what it consisted of. It was, it was actually a mustard agent stockpile was burned in India. Um, but I couldn't tell you the site. I'm actually not sure where it was. Uh, Libya, 26 tons, you know, that was a troubled program uh, due to the Civil War, stopped the program in the middle of it. The rebel forces or, or tri Libyan tribes uh, ransacked the site. Luckily, none of the weapons were stolen. Gaddafi hid a whole stockpile of over 500 uh, mustard agent artillery shells that were subsequently, um, subsequently declared by the uh, follow-on government. Uh, and destroyed, fortunately, last year. Uh, so that's been actually a, very, a big success. Other than Libya today has 850 metric tons of precursor chemicals, somewhat similar to some of Libya's uh, declared chemicals, and they're now asking for foreign support and potentially removal of the, that from Libya with the success of the Syrian program. Iraq, 2009. The Iraqi, I must say the Iraqis who were very committed to trying, trying to you know, meet the terms of the treaty and get rid of this old stuff they have in these two giant bunkers in, in Iraq have however been very slow off the dime, I must say, very slow to move on it. Uh, the OPCW has not pushed them that much and nobody else has really come forward. They've looked to the Americans to pay for all this uh, and I've always said, listen, the Americans are spending $40 billion in their own country. We've spent over a billion dollars in Russia. We've, we've paid for the Albanian program. Now we've paid for most of the Syrian program. You know, I think America is feeling a little bit under the gun to fund all this themselves. Um, so there's got to be some burden sharing. And the Iraqis, I think, could, afford, could have afforded to handle this a few years ago before ISIS reportedly now have their hands on these bunkers. And then Syria, of course, most recently. Um, let me, uh, next slide, I'll talk more about Syria. Next slide. So uh, two quick things I mentioned earlier, I want to mention too, buried chemical weapons. All the figures you see here are for declared stockpiles. So these are stockpiles which are, which are um, uh, you know, accessible, uh, need to be inventoried, and can be destroyed. This is a picture of uh, a very high you know, uh, a very wealthy neighborhood in northwest Washington, D.C. on the right there, which uh, found buried chemical weapons in the backyard of the Korean ambassador's house back in 1993. No one knew where the, what these were, where they came from. The poor Korean ambassador was just built, digging a little gazebo for his house and happened upon a catch of mustard agent weapons, you know, in the backyard. Uh, it turns out they were buried there after World War I because this, this area, American University in northwest Washington, D.C., uh, was the American research lab in World War I for chemical warfare, which was closed in uh, 1917. And uh, they were given the order just to dig trenches and dump everything they had. So they dug trenches all over northwest Washington, buried all the stuff, uh, laboratory beakers, you know, weapons and the like, and then the whole area was developed over the next hundred years, and no one said boo about chemical weapons. Uh, the army didn't say anything. Uh, real estate developers didn't say anything. Construction crews didn't say anything. We, we surmised that they must have found weapons all the time because they didn't want to you know, halt their construction. They just dug a deeper hole and sort of bulldozed everything in and covered it over with concrete you know, and moved on. So this has been a big issue. Uh, the research, the survey, the excavation still goes on. 
uh, 20 years later in Northwest Washington, and they found you know, a few dozens of weapons and all sorts of old stuff. There are very high levels of arsenic in the, in the groundwater as well, um, and there's been a big debate over the public health impact of all this. And the United States, by the way, has declared, uh, over 15 years ago, declared a suspected 250 burial sites in over 30 states in the United States of old chemical weapons that we'll sooner or later have to deal with. So that's a whole other category of, of uh, follow-up to cleaning up chemical weapons. Next. It's also sea dumped, oh, go back one. Sea dumped weapons. Uh, I just mentioned this. This is a whole you know, lecture in itself, but <clears throat> every warring nation from the 20th century, just about every warring nation, produced chemical weapons and in order to preclude you know, having to go through expensive demilitarization programs like this, they dumped them at sea, particularly after World War II, also, also after World War I. And uh, the dump sites along the east and west coast of the United States, uh, all around Hawaii, uh, there are dump sites throughout the Mediterranean, uh, probably not far from Israel here, I, I suspect, all along the coast of Italy from uh, the fascist uh, government there in World War II and uh, big dump sites all through the Baltic. And the Baltic we marry, worry about most because it's very shallow and there were enormous uh, dump sites, you know, uh, barge loads and ship loads. And the, one of the biggest challenges in all the dumping is that even though uh, the navies and the, and the uh, merchant marines who dumped these were supposed to identify sites and, and map them out where they were dumped and also they could be identified for future maybe excavation and raising or to protect fishing as well, uh, didn't do that for the most part. And they basically, as soon as they got out of harbor, wherever it was in the Baltic or Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, they started rolling them off the side of the ship. So when you actually go and survey uh, these dump sites, you see that typically there are long streams that go for kilometers and kilometers of three, three uh, kind of metal lines. And one is, you know, to port and to starboard and off the stern. They just kept rolling the barrels off in the dump as they went along uh, left and right and, and off the back. So that's a whole another big issue that we talk about a bit at the OPSW, but will need, uh, you know, decades and decades of work. Uh, next. Syria, I just want to talk about briefly. This is the Cape Ray, the U.S. merchant marine ship, which neutralized over 600 tons that uh, Peter talked about this morning somewhere in the middle of the Mediterranean. Uh, of the 1,308 metric tons, uh, the Cape Ray took on 600 tons, about half of it. And there were only 20 metric tons, slightly less than that actually, of mustard agent, uh, and about 580 metric tons of, of what's called DF, which is a precursor chemical to uh, sarin agent. Uh, it was all removed by June, uh, several months late, uh, the Cape Ray hydrolysis took place in August, July and August. Uh, it was finished in the middle of August, and then uh, the, they'll complete the destruction probably by the end of this year. Uh, it, some of the secondary destruction may go on into 2000, will go on in 2015. Uh, next slide. And that's the, that's the uh, field hydrolysis, a uh, field deployable hydrolysis system, the FDHS, they call it, which was uh, built in Aberdeen, Maryland, and the tanks that you see there, which are titanium line tanks, are the mixing tanks for uh, mixing the uh, chemicals and the agent with the hot water and sodium hydroxide in different recipes, depending on what the chemical is. Um, and two of those were deployed uh, on board the ship in a con fully contained structure like you see there. Fully contained structure which, which contains any atmospheric gaseous effluents and uh, any liquid or solid effluence uh, from it. And it was a very successful program, but very controversial uh, in the Mediterranean, obviously. And we can come back to that if you want. Um, some of it burned in, in Britain. Some of it uh, treated in Syria. Uh, the isopropyl alcohol, alcohol, which neutralizes very easily. Uh, some of it burned in the United States and Finland. And then about 6,000 metric tons of effluent uh, burned in the United States, Finland, and Germany. Uh, next. So uh, I'm going to skip through these a bit. Uh, just briefly, you know, these are issues we've dealt with that, you know, should Israel, for example, have a stockpile? I don't know, same as everyone else here, I think whether they do or not, but if they have a stockpile, these are issues that you'd have to deal with. 
a cost. The, you know, to do it uh, legally now under the Chemical Weapons Convention, to destroy your stockpile, you can't bury it, you can't dump it, you can't open burn it, you can't, you know, uh, explode it someplace as, as the United States and Britain did in Iraq. Um, you know, you have to be extremely careful on how you destroy it. So you have to either typically incinerate it in these very high-tech, expensive incinerators, or you have to treat it chemically, uh, which is also quite tedious and expensive. Uh, but the cost has always been a big issue. The United States itself first estimated the total cost at $2 billion. And now we're approaching $40 billion, so it gives you a sense of the, the uh, escalation. Technology choice has been loads of discussions in the United States over the years over what the right and the safest technology is and the most cost efficient. And the big fight has always been between incineration and neutralization. What are the impacts on the public health and the environment? How do you manage all the toxic waste and all the rest? Next. Emergency preparedness, we, you know, we've done this very close to highly populated communities. Uh, there have been houses you know, within, within uh, spitting distance, as we say, within the distance you could throw a baseball from the bunkers and from the uh, facilities. So you can imagine if, <clears throat> you know, uh, if you had a stockpile here in Israel and you were to burn it somewhere, that the communities, you know, downwind of it, your children's schools, your homes, you'd be a little nervous about what might be coming out of the smokestack and whether there'd be any leakage. So there's been a lot of money spent in the United States and, and some in Russia, too, to prepare people for emergency response, to shelter in place, uh, to uh, let them know really what to do if, in fact, the sirens go off and you have to evacuate uh, very quickly. Ironically, this is, this is a Russian test. These are Russian, Russian women actually uh, uh, practicing for emergency evacuation and, and preparedness here. And when we did this in Russia probably 10 years ago, there weren't any men that came to this at all. It was all women. And we asked where, where, the, men, where the men were, and they said, oh, they have serious things to do, you know. I said, well, th this is actually pretty serious. You know, if you had a major leak of nerve agent, you'd consider this pretty serious. Uh, next. And then uh, big issues arose, uh, particularly in the United States and Russia, uh, which had, in the end, you know, did, did it relatively transparently and involved communities and all, which we, were, we helped facilitate. This is a, a picture of uh, the main road in Shuchi in Siberia. So it gives you a sense of the development there, of the community, socioeconomic development. And this is the first hearing we did uh, in Shuchi back in 1996, which we packed the hall and really showed that the Russians were really interested and very concerned over the whole process. But you needed to involve the communities, and the communities, you know, whether it was American or Russian, all said, listen, we've lived with these weapons, you know, for decades and decades. If you're going to spend three, four, five billion dollars on these sites, you know, we have to get a piece of the pie. You know, you got to fix the roads, you got to fix our water and sewer systems and provide us with, <clears throat> provide us with uh, gas, electricity, and things like that. So there's been wide debate over uh, community involvement and investment in the whole programs. And I can, you know, talk all day on that if you'd like. Uh, next slide. This is the town uh, center in Shuchi. So once again, gives you a sense of the sort of developing nature of Shuchi and the, the poverty there. When we were there, you know, the unemployment was over 50%. Uh, the average income of a Russian was probably maybe, if you're lucky, a dollar a day, maybe less than that. Um, so it was very, very poor, you know, underprivileged area, and very uneducated area too. Uh, next. And these are protests. Uh, on the left is a protest in Shuchi. Uh, if you read Russian, you know, it says without guarantees of uh, social protection, uh, there won't be any construction of the factory, of the destruction facility. And safety. safety, right. And on the right-hand side, uh, no VX in Texas. Uh, that's a protest march in um, Houston, Texas, where uh, there's a big Veolia Environmental Services incinerator which burns the effluent from, um, burned the effluent from uh, Newport, Indiana, and also is burning it from the Syrian uh, destruction program. And it's unfortunately a, a very poor African-American community. So you have this big, you know, industrial waste incinerator um, really in a very poor community, which 
leads to issues of environmental justice and social justice and all. Uh, next. And then we've had enormous demonstrations against the Syrian operation in Crete and Cyprus and Greece and Turkey. And there were over 10,000 people at a time turned out uh, protesting the uh, neutralization of the Syrian uh, chemicals on bo uh, in the middle of the Mediterranean and the risks that might mean for uh, fishing and tourist industry and the like. I must say, unfortunately, there was not uh, a lot of outreach uh, in any planned or strategic way in the Mediterranean. And we, we tried to work with the OPSW, we tried to work with the Americans, uh, with, the, um, with the Italians uh, who were hosting the, the, uh, one of their ports, the transportation, and with the United Nations. And essentially, um, there was some you know, limited efforts. There were a couple of conference calls. There was one open house on board the ship in Rota, Spain, which was too little, too late. Um, there was never any, except, except a written response from the Director General at the OPSW, which was quite good, to one of the big protest groups in, in Greece. Uh, but we had proposed that we organize uh, public dialogues in Athens and Istanbul and Crete and Cyprus and, um, and Rome and possibly Madrid, uh, and nobody, nobody would allow that. And we also, uh, I could s and tell you the, send you the letter if you want to see, that was signed by many of us to, to the U.S. government to do this. We, recognize, we recommended um, real-time uploads of what was happening on the Cape Ray and live uh, webcams on the Cape Ray so people could go up 24-7 and check out how well the the neutralization was going on board the ship, which we had a lot of confidence in. U.S. government ref absolutely refused, wouldn't do any of that. So once again, it was, it was to some extent disappointing after all the work we've done for over 20 years trying to you know, involve stakeholders and promote transparency that even some of the best and most transparent countries, here we are, we're talking about NATO, we're talking about you know, the United States, and we're talking about the OPSW, which has been very good in, in stakeholder involvement and all. It just didn't happen at all, unfortunately. Uh, next. So I'll just, that's our little outreach office in Shuchi. We had for years and two of our outreach directors who were wonderful there. Uh, next slide. Uh, you'll recognize the guy on the left there, a little bit younger looking. Um, that was an orphanage in Shuchi. We, uh, we, every, every city and village and all we dealt with in Russia and continue to, uh, we really adopt you know, all sorts of needy programs. This was the orph orphanage in in uh, Shuchi, which had absolutely nothing. So we, we donated a lot of clothes and food and money and computers and things of that nature to, to help them, but also to build solidarity within the community and involvement. And, and to the right is actually a typical outreach program of our Shuchi director, uh, Galina Veprova, who is wonderful, very strong environmental activist uh, in, uh, in Shuchi with some of the uh, farming community there. Next. So I'll, I'll just finish very soon with a few conclusions. Chemical agents are no longer viable military weapons, whether or not you have them. We don't know if Israel has them. We don't know if Egypt has them, but they're no, really no longer viable of any use. They're taboo, essentially morally reprehensible and a dangerous burden. You don't want a chemical weapon <laughs> stockpile. You don't even want to have the option of a chemical weapon stockpile today. Secondly, all s possessor states must complete safe elimination. The Russians, Americans still working at it, Iraq has to do it, Syria isn't completed yet, and Libya isn't completed yet. All non-member states must join the CWC, and this is one of the messages from this seminar, I hope. Uh, Angola, Egypt, Israel, Myanmar, North Korea, and South Sudan. As you've heard, I think, from Peter and also from uh, Jean Pascal, Angola and Myanmar are just about to join. They've had long discussions. Israel has, has been represented as an observer country at the OPSW at the annual Conference of States Parties. Uh, we've talked to Israel for years now, and all my Israeli friends say to me, uh, we signed the treaty, we abide by the treaty, we do not have a chemical weapons stockpile, but there's no proof of that. We don't know. You know? So uh, I think it's really time that Israel doesn't wind up, as I say, in the end with South Sudan and North Korea, which is what will happen. Um, next. Protection of the environment, public health, Worker safety and weapons demilitarization processes is an absolute necessity, and this trumps any legal deadlines and budget limits as far as I'm concerned. I mean, the, the main goal when, you, when we destroy these stockpiles and clean up chemical weapons is protection. 
we don't want to kill people in trying to eliminate, you know, deadly weapons. Um, that's not the whole purpose. And in fact, the Director General of the OPSW repeats this uh, over and over again. This is kind of a mantra. I think we've we've gotten a lot of the OPSW officials to to talk about all the time now, and not quite in the same language, but. Uh, secondly, transparency, stakeholder involvement, public dialogue, consensus building are really essential to program success. So any country that has a demilitarization program really has to go through this to some extent. Syria was a bit of a unique case given the civil war, obviously. But Third, abolition of a whole class of weapons of mass destruction is really a historic achievement. It's the first time I'm aware of in history that we've been able to get 99% of the world so far to agree to total abolition and verification of a whole class of weapon system, in this case, a, wep a big weapon of mass destruction. And next slide, which is almost the last. Article 10 provides for assistance and protection. So it's a big advantage to countries to join the treaty and, and participate in all that information sharing uh, and sometimes financial support and technical support. Article 11 provides international cooperation for economic and technological development. In other words, peaceful uses of chemistry. So it's a big advantage if you want to develop your chemical industry and share technology and the like. And uh, the verification annex, I won't go in, you know, you went into this a bit, but the verification annex limits trade in any banned chemical and, and specifically prohibits trade with any non-state party. So one of the big issues for Israel is I assume there's some chemical industry here. Where is Israel getting its chemicals from? I doubt it's from Angola. You know, I doubt it's from South Sudan. So if Israel's importing any chemical at all from an industrialized country, it's probably illegal if it's on any of the schedules in the Chemical Weapons Convention. So one of the big issues is, is I think people could look, begin to look at the chemical trade here in Israel and to determine whether there were any countries trading with. All of this, of course, is supposed to be reported to the OPSW, as, as Peter and, and we know. Uh, but in fact, the reporting to the OPSW on exports and imports has been, let's say, not perfect. In fact, far from perfect uh, in the past. So that's a big challenge. Next slide, I would just point out that um, uh, that on the right-hand side, you recognize one guy, uh, the shorter one there. Uh, and that's the Director General, a wonderful uh, diplomat from Turkey, Ahmet Uzumcu. And that's his uh, receiving of the Nobel Peace Prize in, in Oslo, Norway. And I was very fortunate to be with him uh, back then and with a number of the, the ambassadors from the OPSW at the time. And on the left is actually uh, himself actually standing with some of the inspectors from Syria, which has been a very, a very uh, dangerous and tedious mission. And the first time that OPSW inspectors have had to put on uh, Kev Kevlar bulletproof vests and operate really in, in, in the middle of a civil war and been shot at and experienced actually improvised explosive devices which blew up one of their vehicles in Syria as well. So it's been a really remarkable mission and I give a lot of credit to the OPSW and, and to the Director General for having carried, carried this all through. And that's it. One quick comment on the letter that, that many of us signed about the Syrian demilitarization program and the lack of transparency is knowing the technology. We were supportive of the technology. And we kept telling the U.S. government, you've got something to brag about here. You're doing something that communities in the United States wanted you to do. Why aren't you explaining that to the people of the Mediterranean? And so, so, again, this technology was a victory for communities, but somehow they couldn't, get, they couldn't process that. On nuclear weapons, there is a sort, of a sort of a bit of an industry of people making guesses of how much Israel actually has and how they got it. And, and there seems to be a clear understanding more of more or less, I mean, it's still a wide range, but sort of between 80 and 200 warheads or something like that. Does something similar exist on Israel's uh, chemical stockpile and the other the other question is it's, it's really uh, this is bewildering to me it's like nobody has ever done that like sort of see what Israel imports in chemicals and if that violates the convention nobody has ever done that serious on Israeli an Israeli chemical weapon stockpile I don't personally know if Israel has a stockpile or not I've, I've seen no information in the public domain um, the Israeli uh, foreign ministry official who comes 
uh, pretty much every year to the annual Conference of States Parties in The Hague denies that, um, as said to all of us probably privately, uh, Israel doesn't have a stockpile. But we know Israel developed chemical weapons uh, long ago in the, in the 40s and 50s. Uh, so it could, and it certainly has the, the wherewithal uh, and the, the knowledge, the technical knowledge to do so. I, I just don't know. Um, and that's why w we raise and talk about uh, chemical weapons destruction. If it doesn't have a stockpile, it could easily ratify. And the toughest thing is then having, as I think uh, maybe Jean Pascal or Peter mentioned earlier, uh, or maybe it was you, you, uh, you have to your declaration to the OPSW when you join, as Syria is still going through, is a big, long, complicated declaration. And so it's very, it's very hard for countries that have chemical industry, or particularly those who've developed chemical weapons in the past. Um, you know, it's, I've never seen one because they're mostly classified documents, but they're seven, 800 pages long. And you have to declare everything in your program, exports, imports, you know, uh, precursor chemical supplies, uh, laboratories, uh, hmm? burial, burial sites, all that, uh, back to 1946. Uh, and there's some question, of course, with Syria as to whether Syria's really had adequate documentation for all this. Uh, but all declarations, you know, the Russian and American, I can imagine how complicated those were. Um, uh, they're largely kept classified uh, because I think countries are very sensitive over where they obtain their chemicals who helped them with technology in the past. The Americans have actually opened up their own declaration. I think the American declaration is the only one that's public uh, knowledge. Uh, the Russian, you know, the, Albani the Alba Albanians are very careful about talking about how they receive their chemicals from China. The South Koreans don't want to talk about where they receive their chemicals or technology from, but their stockpile looked very much like the newest American stockpile. Um, and of course, Syria, you know, Iraq, all of that is very sensitive, partly due to all the European suppliers, I think, uh, to them all over time, and the, and the Russian suppliers. You may remember the head of the Russian program in the 1990s, uh, remember, was arrested in Russia for too many visits to Syria, uh, and sort of business on the side he apparently was doing, apparently with chemical weapons development for the Syrians. Um, so the declarations are very sensitive, but I've never seen any public information on Israeli trade in chemicals. Um, and I'm not sure, do you know, Peter, if the, if the trade and annual declarations uh, to the uh, OPSW are public information? I don't think so. I don't think they are. Um, there's, yeah, I mean, the, the confidentiality arrangements that the OPSW and any, any of these multilateral treaties tend to be at least from the NGO perspective, somewhat controversial. We all think that this should all be public information and knowledge and might help prevent certain countries from doing certain things they really shouldn't be doing. Um, but obviously, um, confidentiality is a big issue for certain countries, more, some more than others. And um, we all know the countries within these multilateral organizations that are particularly adamant on their confidentiality and it tends to be probably nobody around the table here right now. Um, but it, it is an ongoing problem, and I do think a country like South Korea, uh, which refuses to even have its name mentioned as a possessor country, is really abusing the confidentiality privilege. <clears throat> and I would strongly argue that all the declarations that have been made by the eight possessor states so far should be made public uh, eventually. These are good news stories. They've destroyed their stockpiles. Why, why shouldn't the Indians talk publicly about how well their program went, why shouldn't the South Koreans do the same? Um, so, anyway. Um, <coughs> yeah, thank you. Um, uh, a couple of uh, points in terms of uh, the questions and discussions come up. Uh, first, um, I, as far as I know, Schedule 3 chemicals are not under an export control reporting mechanism of the Chemical Weapons Convention. That was something states' parties had to decide upon, I think, five years after entry into force, and they never took a decision. So we're basically talking about Schedule II chemicals. Um, I do not think that we actually would find information that the state has illegally 
uh, transferred such uh, chemicals uh, to Israel. I think what we might find is that uh, the Israeli industry actually substituted some of the controlled chemicals for alternatives and that these might uh, entail an environmental opportunity cost to Israel uh, in the sense that they're not the safest or the cleanest types of uh, methods uh, to use. This is quite uh, a possibility uh, we would be talking about. Uh, in terms of uh, if there is still some uncertainty about uh, what Israel has been up to in more recent years, I think most of those questions relate to the Alal plane that crashed near Amsterdam in uh, 92 and actually had three of the key precursors for the manufacture of sarin on board. Now, uh, what was interesting about that uh, payload was uh, each one of those chemicals had legitimate application for other civilian uh, uses, uh, including in the manufacture of flame retardants. Uh, they could also have had uh, legitimate application <laughs> for uh, research, you know, uh, testing gas masks, uh, MBC suits, uh, things uh, like that. Although general opinion is uh, the volumes on board of the plane were a bit too large. They were too small for an offensive chemical weapon program, but then we don't know how many such transports took place. Uh, which, if it were for the latter, would put the United States on the spot uh, because as the source uh, of these uh, chemicals and you know, the Australia group uh, was uh, functioning uh, there, but the Australia group does not uh, prohibit the transfer. It just asks people to check really well that you want to do it. So of course, uh, Israel is not a bad country. Um, so uh, these are a couple of issues. Uh, in terms of uh, Israel moving forwards with uh, ratification, in, uh, in the context of uh, the Middle East uh, zone, and this is also a message I want to pass on uh, to Dina uh, for uh, Egypt. Well, one of the things that both countries actually could start doing is um, do national trial inspections uh, according to the mechanisms uh, you know, uh, foreseen in the Chemical Weapons Convention and, you know, report on your own trials. Of course, it's not verification. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that nothing helps. But first, it gives um, the people inside the country the necessary expertise uh, to deal with those uh, materials. In Israel, you could have a situation where uh, the whole site at uh, Nesiona, where uh, chemical and biological defense are grouped together and the Weizmann Institute is right next door with uh, nuclear stuff, that there could be um, hesitation whether the uh, inspections might pick up certain things that have nothing to do with uh, chemical weapons and would reveal other types of uh, information. Well, you know, Israel and India work together on so many different aspects of security. In India, the DRDO, the research establishment, uh, more or less the equivalent of uh, Nesiona, also was a conglomerate with uh, various issues. I mean, they can impart experience on how they managed to uh, have the inspections done uh, in those sites without, um, you know, uh, information on other programs or whatever being released. Um, but also, uh, I think it would really be interesting if uh, Israel and Egypt were each to do such uh, undertakings. It's part of a CBM process, you know, and... Oh, sorry, yes, uh, a confidence... What? Yeah, uh, well, you know, the, it's, like, it's like radar. It almost becomes a word in its own right. Um, but... Uh, Actually, it's part of uh, information exchanges between the two countries uh, for both of them uh, to become more comfortable with uh, the processes. Me, Israel negotiate the treaty, uh, so they should be quite familiar with it. But there is a lot of practice. And perhaps very important to say, um, Paul has mentioned the initial declaration. It's quite a hefty 
uh, activity and depending on the size of your industry from hundreds to thousands of, of uh, pages uh, to go through. But, you know, Israel, Egypt would not stand alone in doing that. If uh, progress is being made towards ratification, towards accession of the convention, the OPCW is only too happy to make its expertise available and to help the prospective states party in uh, developing that uh, initial declaration. This is what's happening in Myanmar, this is what's happening in uh, Angola, and there are quite a few of these uh, activities going on. I mean, it's not as if you stand there all alone and all of a sudden you have to get it right from the first time. There is a whole educational and uh, assistance uh, program to uh, accompany uh, that particular process. <coughs> but I, I think, uh, you know, if you can actually uh, start doing certain things yourself, if you have nothing, I mean, what's the cost? The benefit is great, but what's the cost of engaging in the exercise? And what starts out as a confidence-building measure by joining the treaty, it because, well, it's no longer... Uh, a CBM, you publish a confidence building measure, it's a declaration you formally and legally bindingly make to an organization. But essentially it's the same thing uh, going on. So that's like my final wisdom. I, I don't really have much to, to add to that. I think Jean Pascal's kind of wrapped it up fairly, fairly clearly. Um, um, Schedule 3 chemicals in particular, um, as far as the uh, OPCW, I think, um, text is concerned, you only really need um, some form of end-user certificate to export it to another country. So that end-user certificate may be believable from the perspective of uh, the exporter, but other people may look at it and think, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that that's a, 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 a viable um, certificate of peaceful end-users. Um, and yeah, I think the Albania case that, um, that Paul mentioned is a, is a key example of how difficult it can be to put together these initial declarations, but there is a huge, huge, huge array of um, various tools and mechanisms available provided by the OPCW itself in the form of um, kind of training and uh, technical outreach and legal assistance, but also from non-governmental organizations. Um, I know that my colleague Scott has been to a number of countries around the world to, to provide advice and as to how to do the legal side of things. So it, it may seem like a daunting um, task given the history of chemical stockpiles that Paul outlined, but there's, there's tools aplenty to uh, to move these things forward. I, you had a question too, but let me let me first say um, just two things. One is, I just returned from um, about a month ago from uh, Kuala Lumpur in uh, Malaysia, and it was a very good example of what the uh, the advice and assistance that can people can provide. One of your colleagues, Yasmin Balchi, <coughs> and I, uh, funded by the U.S. State Department, organized a four-day. A training workshop for senior Yemeni uh, businessmen and government officials on uh, treaty OPCW Chemical Weapons Convention treaty implementation. So uh, we had law enforcement officials there from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We had a number of other experts in different areas. So uh, it is possible if a country like Israel or Egypt want to join <coughs> or make the decision to join, there's loads of training and, and help that can be made. And the other point that uh, nobody is probably thinking about, universality, as, as Jean-Pascal talked about, means the OPSW has access to every single part of the world for inspections. So where else is there, other than these six countries, do you think that the OPSW doesn't have access to today? There are two places in particular I'm thinking of. One of them very near here, Palestine. Now, I don't know if Palestine has chemical industry, probably not much, um, if any, but this Palestine, which needs to have access, OPSW inspectors have to have access to, and there's an island called Taiwan, and at the OPSW, you call it the T word, because whenever you mention the T word, Taiwan, uh, the Chinese ambassador is like a jump in the jack-in-the-box, you know, <laughs> jumps out and... <laughs> wants to raise a point of, you know, there's only one China, there's no such thing as Taiwan, it's part of, no, no, no. But, but uh, Taiwan has one of the world's largest chemical industries. And so it, we need eventually to have access to Taiwan, and nobody is concerned that Taiwan is somehow building a chemical weapons stockpile. But, um, you know, you still need to inspect, inspect and verify. Um, and I think sooner or later something will have to be done 
uh, with those two regions. Uh, whenever I mention them as states or countries, you know, the Chinese in particular jump out of their skins. Um, and uh, and maybe maybe in Israel, when, when you mention Palestine as a state, you know, the Israelis jump out of their skins. But um, uh, regardless, you know, you have to have access to all potential uh, sites for chemical weapons activities, chemical industry, production, storage, you know, transport, um, and management. So.